These are Commodore 1084 monitors manufactured in 1988 by Philips. If you've been around a while, you know that I love using CRTs and this model in particular. So when they inevitably fail due to old age, I have no choice but to fix them over and over again. It may be a fool's errand, but when did I ever back down from a bad idea? Welcome back. In today's bit, we'll be taking a look at these three monitors and attempting to diagnose and fix what's wrong with them. If you're just joining us, I did a full review of my childhood 1084S in a previous episode where it failed catastrophically during shooting. If you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend you check out that video first, as we'll be picking right up where we left off. Starting on the left, we have the 1084 that I picked up in the Toronto estate sale auction. In the middle is a stereo model from the same lot. And on the right is a well-used and presently defunct 1084S from my childhood that I've had ever since I bought a second-hand Commodore 128 with money made by pulling weeds at the local farm way back in the late 80s. All of these monitors were manufactured in Taiwan by Philips. The 1084 has a May 1988 build date. The 1084S from the same auction was built a month later in June of the same year. And my childhood 1084S is the baby of the family with a July build date. Here's a quick review of my old monitor. It's been a trusty companion for most of my life, serving first as a display for my C128, then as a TV in college, later for video editing with an Amiga, and most recently for all manner of retro computer and game consoles. It does show a fair bit of wear from those many years of service, and like most other examples of the model, suffered a broken front door hinge that I repaired with a 3D printed part. While in the middle of making the previous 1084S episode, a strange flicker started to appear on the screen during filming. Of course, the monitor would wait until I was making a review video about it to develop a problem, right? The situation quickly went from bad to worse, at which point the tribute turned into a repair video instead. After a bunch of troubleshooting, I eventually found the culprit, a shorted and burnt out coil in the deflection yoke. Further disassembly, cleaning, and repair of the part is definitely on today's agenda. Moving on to the estate sale finds. This is also a 1084S, identical in every way to my broken model, with the major exception being that it still works great and shows less wear and tear. Like mine, it's starting to show signs of a failing front door latch, but it hasn't broken off entirely yet. After using it for a bit, I can say that this example is in pretty good overall condition. The colors are nice and crisp, with no discernible burn-in. Convergence and geometry are also pretty good, considering this monitor has never been serviced, recapped, or even had any of its settings adjusted yet. The previous owner appears to have cut out the blanking plate for the SCART connector, but it's missing entirely on North American models. Previously, I had planned to see if one could be easily added, so I already have the parts on hand to test that theory out. We'll add that to today's list of tasks as well. Last but not least is the 1084. It's the same as the other two, less the stereo speakers. The front door on this one is still fully intact, which is a bit of a rarity. It does suffer from a different problem common to these models, and that's of a broken power switch. It will either fail to stay on or be impossible to turn off. Fortunately, replacement parts are still available, and I've had a few on hand for years for just this eventuality. Finally, if you've seen the Toronto auction lot video, you'll remember that this monitor makes a loud high-pitched whine. It's much louder than the standard 15 kHz CRT noise that my aging ears can no longer hear. It's so bad, in fact, that it hurts to have the power on for more than a few seconds at a time. Maybe it'd be best to demonstrate the problem visually instead. Here's a recording of the good 1084S when it's powered on. Notice the spike at the end of the spectrum. That's the CRT's 15 kHz whine, and it's perfectly normal. 
The sound is caused by the flyback, deflection yoke, or other components in the system vibrating at the horizontal refresh rate. I normally filter this frequency out on all my videos because it's unpleasant to those who can still hear it. Now, let's look at the noisy monitor. Right away, we can see that the 15 kHz whine is around 5 decibels higher than the other unit. But that's not all. There's a new peak around 11 kHz, and perhaps that's what I'm hearing, or some combination of both. Anyway, it's bad enough that the display is unusable the way it currently is, so another item for our list. First, I'm going to disassemble my dead 1084S to try and better assess the extent of the damage to the deflection yoke. I've probably done this more than 50 times by now, and these things come apart really easily once you know where everything is. Be gentle when removing the neck board. I've already repaired cracked solder joints on this thing once before. I'm going to mark the position of the purity and convergence rings relative to the picture too for later reassembly in the hopes of avoiding having to adjust them from the factory settings. After unscrewing the clamp, the whole assembly just slides right off. The yoke itself is glued to each of the three spacers that fix its distance from the tube. After unscrewing the clamp, I'll have to cut through the old glue to remove the yoke. The yoke contains two sets of wound coils made from copper wire through which a current is passed, generating the magnetic field that steers the electron beams both horizontally and vertically. With a little wiggling and being mindful of the surrounding wires, the yoke should now come free from the place it's been resting for the last 33 years. Now we can get our first good look at the damage. This spot seems to be the worst offender, but there are clearly multiple areas of concern. I'm going to use some isopropyl alcohol on a Q-tip to try and remove the charring and corrosion. This will hopefully give us a better idea of what's going on. After the first round of cleaning, we can see that the problem runs more than just surface deep. In addition to the burn residue, there's clearly exposed copper, indicating that the enamel coating that insulates the wire has failed, either due to heat, vibration, or just old age. It's not just in one location either. There's evidence of scorching in six distinct places. I'm really not sure why this is, because the monitor was working fine right up to the moment it wasn't, so I would have thought there'd only be a single point of failure. This area is so badly damaged that the wire burnt clean through. I've pried it up a little to show where the break is. I suspect this is what finally did the monitor in. Upon closer inspection, I discovered something interesting. There's damage present everywhere the windings come in contact with the rubber spacers. Perhaps there's a chemical reaction that's causing damage to the wire's enamel coating? Or maybe the wear is due to friction over time as the wires vibrate at 15 kHz. This is pretty damning evidence that all of these monitors will eventually suffer from similar problems if nothing is done to prevent it, but it still doesn't explain the largest of the damaged areas we saw. Because this thing is in really rough shape, I've hatched a plan. I really don't know what I'm doing, as this is the first time I've ever worked on a deflection yoke before, so it's a bit of a Hail Mary, but it starts with cleaning everything more thoroughly than before. Next, I'll expose the two ends of the brake so I can work on them. That done, I'll tin the wire ends using the hot iron and solder to melt back a bit of the enamel.
Normally, you'd use magnet wire here, which has a copper core and an enamel coating, but I don't have any on hand, so I'll just use a short section of wire wrap wire to bridge the broken ends. Geometry might not ever be perfect, but with this tiny section of repair, it'll hopefully be good enough. Now, on to the next part of my daring plan. I'm going to apply clear lacquer to the repair and also to each of the six areas where the damage is present in the hopes of both re-insulating the exposed wire as well as preventing any future damage. I'll apply three generous coatings and give them sufficient time to dry in between. I'll try and tidy up this repair as best as I can so as not to disrupt the magnetic field any more than necessary. Like I said, this is more or less a last ditch effort to save this thing. And there we go, all lacquered up and looking, honestly, not too bad. I've tested the yoke and there is continuity on both coils, so I guess it's time to reinstall and see if we still have a short or not. Fingers crossed. And drum roll, please. Well, we have high voltage, that's a good sign. But I think I hear some sizzling. Let me get around and take a better look. Yep, I definitely hear some sizzling and smell burning. Balls. So good news and bad news. The area that had the worst damage shows sign of bubbling in the lacquer that I just applied. I'm now 100% positive that the problem is more than surface deep. That said, my repair job seems to have held up just fine and shows no sign of failure, so that's encouraging at least. I went in and dug a little deeper, and now we can see the true extent of the problem. There's so much corrosion under the surface, it's not going to be possible to repair without completely rewinding the yoke. That's beyond my current level of expertise, so I'm going to hang on to this part for now while I look for a suitable replacement and evaluate other options. I'm not sure how this internal corrosion got so bad. The monitor has always been stored indoors and never in an attic, basement, or other damp, hot, or humid location. Perhaps this is just a result of age, but it seems suspicious to me. I don't want to blame it on material or manufacturing defect, but I suppose that could be a possibility. Moving on, let's take a look inside the noisy 1084 and see if anything jumps out at us. Hopefully not literally. First, I'll perform a quick visual inspection to see if there are any bulging or leaky caps, sign of arcing or burning, or any other obvious damage. Apart from some dust, everything looks pretty good in here, so on to step two. With the power turned on, I'll listen to try and determine the general area I think the high frequency noise is coming from. It's hard to pin down though, it seems like it's coming from everywhere. I'm going to unplug the deflection yoke and power on the screen with no source attached, just to see if the noise is still present. Spoiler, it is. To try and pinpoint the source, I attempted to listen to specific areas through this cardboard tube. It's still hard to tell, but it seems like the noise is coming from these large caps back here. As I mentioned earlier, these displays are easy to work on. There is one annoyance though, and that's the RF shield. 
It's soldered on in a whole bunch of places. You have to be gentle removing it or you can rip up the ground plane on the motherboard. Also be on the lookout for tabs that are both soldered in and twisted in place. Fortunately, I ordered a lot of extras when I recapped my old display, so I already had both of these caps on hand. And as always, I like to mark the new parts, so I know these have been replaced when I look next time. Balls. Now we have to make a decision. This one needs a new yoke. This one works, but it's not usable without either a full recap or a new flyback. I'm really not sure which. I could order the new parts and replace everything for about $100 and three or four hours of work, but I have another idea, so hear me out. The 1084S has already been fully recapped and has a new flyback and horizontal output transistor. Unlike this one, it's a stereo model. And most importantly, I've had it ever since I was barely a teenager, and it means a lot to me. I think it makes the most sense to borrow the good yoke from this one so I can have one fully functional unit instead of two broken ones. Then I can continue searching for a compatible yoke, order the replacement parts, and fix everything all at once later on down the road. I've never so much as tried anything like this before, but I've been emboldened by watching and learning from other creators on YouTube, such as Adrian's Digital Basement and Retrotech USA, whose channels I've linked to in the description. In some ways, the internet failed to live up to its promise of bringing people closer together and being a definitive repository of truth. On the other hand, it has allowed small communities like ours to flourish and exchange knowledge at unprecedented levels. Someone like me, who has no particular level of skill, can learn to rebuild a car engine, construct a home, or fix a CRT simply by watching a few videos on YouTube. The wealth of information we have available at our fingertips is really mind-blowing when you think about it. Anyway, I hope watching content like this will inspire you to step outside your comfort zone from time to time and try something new. Just don't electrocute yourself, okay? Now that's more like it. I don't see any signs of damage. Perhaps this unit doesn't have as many hours on it? Still, I'm not taking any chances, so I will apply lacquer to the spots where the yoke contacts the rubber spacers as a preventative measure. I've also covered the spacers with a heavy duty packing tape just on the off chance the rubber was causing an adverse chemical reaction with the magnet wires enamel coating. The good yoke goes on my dead 1084S along with the original purity and convergence ring assembly. I could have swapped the entire tube from one display to the other, and that's still an option if this attempt doesn't produce a good image. Here we go. First test with no source connected. Nice. We have high voltage and there are no unusual sounds, smells, or smoking. Okay, now let me test with a composite source connected. Hey look, we have an image, and it's pink. Okay, that's weird. Nothing we did today should affect the color balance. I thought it might just be one of the controls having fallen out of adjustment, but nope, it's either pink or nothing. Huh. I want to try a different composite source just in case there was a problem with the device or cable I was using. But nope, the C64 is pink too. If I adjust the pots for the individual beams on the neck board, I can force it to look kind of normal, but there's still a pink hue in the lower right corner of the screen. At least I know all three guns are working, but the composite source is getting mangled somehow during processing. I played around a bit more and discovered something interesting. When connected to an analog RGB source, everything looks fine. 
So the problem only manifests when using an NTSC input and is probably unrelated to the work I did today. I must have fudged something up when I was troubleshooting and replacing discrete components in the last episode, so I'll need to go back and revisit my work. With a little adjustment to the screen and focus controls, as well as dialing in each of the RGB guns, it's looking pretty good now. I haven't tried to adjust the geometry or convergence yet, so this is just what I ended up with after swapping the yoke. There's definitely room for improvement, but it's a darn good first attempt and I'm thrilled that my childhood 1084S is back up and running. Since we have a working RGB display, let's investigate the possibility of adding SCART. The header is present on the board here, but there's a wire in the way. It traces back to the input for the right speaker, which gives me hope that the other pins are also connected on the board. Weird way to bodge in an extra speaker input though. So, why am I doing this on a North American model anyway? Well, many 16-bit era computers and game consoles support RGB video, even if we have no way to use it here. Off-the-shelf SCART cables are inexpensive and readily available for most systems, so by adopting the European standard connection, I don't need to build custom cables for each system to get the best possible video quality out of them. I picked up the appropriate connector from console5.com, and I'll place a link to it in the description. With the solder removed from all the pads and the audio jumper wire out of the way, I should be able to install the connector. Yep, perfect fit. Now it should just be a matter of soldering all the pins. The traces exist and appear to be connected to other components, so I'm hoping this will just work. Ignore the ugly ground plane at the bottom. That's just where the RF shield attaches, and some of the pads got lifted the first time I was in here years ago, with nothing more than my $15 Radio Shack soldering iron and a dream. Now, I need to reconnect the audio input wire to the SCART connector, but this audio amplifier board is in the way. It's located elsewhere on the non-stereo models, but it's easy enough to remove. I couldn't really get a good shot of reattaching the wire, but here you can see it's connected directly to the leg at the back of the SCART connector. Think it'll work? Place your bets now. Okay, well, hold up. There's an image, there's color, and I even verified that the sound is working, so we're most of the way there. What appears to be missing, however, is the sync signal. SCART uses composite sync on pin 20, and while the 1084S normally ingests separate horizontal and vertical sync, I know for a fact from testing that it can also handle a C-sync signal connected to the H-sync input. If we look at pin 20 on the SCART connector and trace it on the board, it arrives at jumper 9289, which is clearly missing, as there are no legs soldered in place. Jumper 9274 is also missing, which enables SCART's RGB fast switching, so I'll add both of those now. It's always a good idea to hang on to your component trimmings, as they make great jumper wires. Did I mention that I love my 3D printed lead bender? And there we go, the missing jumpers are now installed. Let's give it another test and see if that improves things any. This is the cable I built way back in the very first Mr. episode. Now I no longer need a rat's nest of converters and adapters to use it with my 1084S. Fantastic! 
I'm quite surprised that all the other components required for SCART input, such as transistors, were present, but the lowly jumpers were not. I'm not going to complain, though. In this regard, it was very much the same as adding analog RGB input to my old 1902 monitor. Anyway, I'm quite pleased with this result, and I will be ordering up another connector for the Toronto 1084S as well. So, what's next? I still need to investigate and fix the NTSC input, but I suspect it's going to be something simple, like a bridged solder joint, or that I replaced a resistor with an incorrect value. I'll also need to find a replacement yoke and start ordering parts to recap and replace the flyback on the noisy 1084. I could also spend some time trying to perfect the geometry and convergence on this display, but I'm quite happy with how it's working already. This has been a great learning experience for me, and I hope you got something out of it too. That's about all the time we've got for today. The good news is, my childhood 1084S is up and running again. Mostly. Things didn't go as well as I had hoped today, and there's still a lot of work left to be done. But, in the immortal words of last Tuesday's lunch, two out of three ain't bad. I hope you enjoyed this bit, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on RetroBits.